This video is sponsored by ExpressVPN. So really last month I made a best of the year so far video, which you should definitely watch because how else are you supposed to know what to watch and what not to watch? But at the end I jokingly said something like, but hey, I guess we're still waiting to find out what this year's 365 is gonna be. This year's 365 is gonna be. And suddenly I started getting, oh boy, wait till you hear about life. Pretty sure Netflix has released this year's 365. It's called Sex Life. Hey Amanda, can you make a video about sex life? And hey, I'm not one to disappoint, except my parents when I make these videos. So I checked into it and it's not this year's 365 because 365 is a movie. This is a series, a concentrated series of the most toxic back and forth dramatic behavior of people being Stupid. I was gonna have to sit through eight episodes over six and a half hours of a show that everyone was comparing to 365 days. And honestly, not super similar at all. Except in one area. There's a lot of sex. In fact, there's more of it, which makes sense. The running time for this has to be at least three times the length of 365. I think it's easily just as graphic or maybe even more so. I wasn't gonna like fact check that. I did the crappy math and roughly 39 minutes and 57 seconds of this show is sex scenes. Shocking, based on the name, I know. And this was another way it's similar is the unhealthy ways sex is used in this show and the uh, toxic nature of the relationships in general. The base concept of this show is actually quite reasonable, but the execution, oh God. So much insane back and forth drama happens in the show and yet nothing feels like it happens at all. Somehow this simultaneously could have been condensed into a movie or split into two seasons. This is also a rare situation where I'm not reading the book the show is based on. I'm just not. I love myself too much this week. I'm going away for an extended weekend. I'm taking a little break. I don't need this. I hear the book is actually quite funny and then the show just obviously builds up the dramatics to extreme levels. And it's not technically the same story. So I, I, I feel like I'm good just watching what Netflix made. Sex Life is based on the memoir, 44 chapters about four men by school psychologist B.B. Easton, in which she describes the four main loves she had in life before she ends up with her husband. And more specifically talks about the sexual nature of those relationships relationships as a way to fill the void she's feeling in her current marriage. Except one day her husband reads her journal and ends up changing his sexual behavior. Basically started treating the whole thing like an instruction manual, which how it's implemented into the show ends up feeling pretty messed up. And if it had stayed as that, it probably would have been fine. Like a quirky little story about how a couple that was stuck in a routine managed to spice things up after learning that they weren't great at communicating. But then the last paragraph of the description stood out to me. Because even though I'm sure the show amps up the insane amounts of drama. It seems like some of the mind games are right out of the memoir. This book chronicles the year I spent toying with my husband's mind and ignoring all ethical standards of psychology. Ah! I hope it's just to the extent that she purposely left this journal she was writing out in the open so that he would read it instead of him just stumbling upon it, but yeah. So that brings us to the show, something that starts off pretty normal but then quickly falls into some of the most insanely toxic behavior I could possibly imagine from everyone involved. We follow Billy, a married housewife with two kids who's feeling nostalgia for her past self and starts writing journal entries fantasizing about former relationships and her sexual adventures. The way he works in, in my kitty cat. <laughs> Do people talk like this? And at this point, I was still on board. She's home all day with the kids, one of which is a baby. Her husband is a super focused investment banker trying to make partner. It makes sense that things aren't as steamy as they used to be. So it makes sense that someone would start thinking about the way they used to be and the light they left behind as they're aging into parenthood. It's why people have midlife crises. Mortality scares us. Doesn't mean you don't love the life you have, just means you miss aspects of how things were. So as I was watching the first episode, I wasn't sure what people found so tantalizing about it. Like, was it just the fact that there was a lot of sex? Because that's not something I'm specifically gonna call out. I know it might seem like that sometimes, but it's always in conjunction with something else. This isn't really that much different than anything else that's aimed at women that's essentially more plot-driven porn. And it's okay, it's fine, like your sexy trash. But yeah, first episode, she's just kind of going through her past life and then gets fixated on this one particular ex she used to have while struggling with feeling sexy as a stay-at-home mom in her perfect house with her perfect husband. But nothing that people all over the world don't deal with. It's 
it's normal to go a bit stir crazy when you feel like the dynamic of your relationship has changed moving into motherhood. I would assume I'm not a mother. But then the show descends into a horrible mess that has me so terrified of the suburban lifestyle that I am moving out of this home and back into a downtown apartment. I was already moving, but no, I hate this. However, I can definitely see how this appeals to people. It's got the steamy sex to get the Fifty Shades crowd. It's got the insane over the top back and forth drama that drives so much of television these days. I can also see how this would appeal to people who want to relive aspects of their younger selves. Like you can still be sexy as a mom. Also, if you read a bunch of steamy drama romance novels, this is probably going to be right up your alley. You're going to be hooked from start to finish. And it also has the hate watch potential because it is so absurd. But I can easily see how someone would commit to watching this entire thing while doing chores or other things around the house. Just to see how much worse things can get while yelling at the screen. I know for me personally, it took until the final episode for it to hit my annoyance threshold where I wanted to throw my iPad into a wall. First off, it stars Sarah Shahi from The L Word, so my first thought was, oh God, no, please not Carmen. Because if I'm gonna watch a super sexualized trashy show, it's gonna be The L Word. See, we just need to be honest with ourselves. Mommies, you know what you're doing when you watch Fifty Shades. Anyways, when I first started watching this, I think I made it about 40 seconds in before somebody was getting fingered in a bathroom at a club and I thought, no, another day when I am stronger. Well, that day arrived and we're kind of immediately shown some of the reasons why she's just not feeling sexy anymore. And despite her current emotions of not feeling satisfied with the intimacy in her relationship, she outlines exactly how much and why she loves her husband and his body. How she sees them together to the end and then when they die, she's gonna hunt him down in the afterlife so that they can make more babies and create a family all over again. He's her everything. But then she immediately goes on to explain all the ways that he's basically shit compared to her ex-boyfriend that you can't stop thinking about. And that ex is Brad, motorcycle riding, leather jacket wearing, record label owning bad boy with an Australian accent. Always the way. So that basically seems to be the central conflict. The clean cut good guy that uses words like who hot to describe his altruistic tendencies and not lady bits who provides stability and safety. Cooper sucked me in with his change the world hoo ha. And the sex fueled bad boy who struggles with his emotions but keeps things exciting. <laughs> But she stresses that it's just the rush that she misses. But it feels like she's lying to herself, like she says she loves Cooper, that he's endgame, can't imagine her life without him, but is constantly writing in her journal about how he's inadequate in all these different ways, calling her best friend, saying she can't stop thinking about Brad. A guy she literally hasn't spoken to in over eight years just makes it hard to believe that she's in it for the long haul with Cooper here. And for some reason, she kept all the pictures and the videos from their relationship and starts watching one of him naked in bed, which resulted in my eyes being subjected to Fuzzy man ass. Netflix, what did I do to deserve this? Also, ma'am, your children are right here. So we're getting all these stories and thoughts by way of her writing a journal. A journal her husband found on her computer and started reading. But it seems like she just left the laptop open on the counter, so still a privacy violation, but a baited one. And he's pissed. Not just because he's jealous that she's fantasizing about sex with her ex-boyfriends, but also because she didn't tell him about that side of her life or even about Brad at all. This guy who before him was the most important relationship she ever had. And they've been together for eight years and have two kids. So his method of taking back control is aggressively railing her against the kitchen counter. And he was really aggressive right from the get go, which was pretty concerning considering he's supposed to be the good guy, but she's into it. I also just can't get over the fact that he has villain face. Like he just reminds me of Homelander. I also know he was the guy in Secret Obsession, but he just has that, that clean cut look that you're just waiting to snap. Reminder that they have a preschool age child that just likes to wander into rooms, but sure, Sure, loud sex in the kitchen. But he's still pissed. She's kind of confused and concerned that they haven't talked about it. So she heads to the city to see her best friend, Sasha. And guess who her best friend casually likes to sleep with secretly? It's Brad. What went from casual fantasies and yearning for her youth is staring her in the face. So the story tells itself in a way where she's winding through the tumultuous relationship with Brad and how it's affecting the current and Brad trying to worm his way back in. Billy not being able to let it go and dealing with the consequences of Cooper seeing her journal which she will continue to write in even though she knows he saw it and will probably continue to look at it. Like if you're gonna be horrible, don't be stupid and horrible. But Cooper immediately tries to spice things up. Cause for the most part, he's a genuinely good guy and he feels bad that he's got complacent. He takes her out on a date, they see a band at a club, then he takes her to someone else's house so they can sneak onto the property and smash in the pool. Which then gets weird because it's obvious he's just trying to recreate all the things she was writing about in her journal, but with him instead. It's 
like a dog peeing on something another dog already peed on to mark territory. Oh, you had sex in a pool? Well, that's what we're gonna have to do right now to erase that. He even insists on having her try to show him some kind of like coital alignment technique just because she wrote about Brad doing it. Like it starts sweet, but then quickly turns into this kind of like pissing match with a memory where he doesn't seem to actually want to be doing the things he's doing. But the homeowner, his client is home, so they have to run from the cops and it's all passion and excitement she's been craving. So she decides to take it as the journal, basically functioning as an instruction manual to get him to behave how she wants. But we're only two episodes in, so things can't be this resolved. So before they can get hot and steamy back at home, he starts thinking about everything he read again, gets sick, and then Brad calls her to say that he can't stop thinking about her. So of course she's a terrible liar and he realizes that seeing him did affect her. The drama, ma'am, your husband just committed a felony for you. How much more excitement do you want? But he's also kind of weird and like the next morning he's jerking it to one of her journal entries. Oh yay. But let's build up who Brad is and their former relationship. So they meet and instantly headed off. They head back to his place because she sees right through him, straight to his daddy issues, and they smash in the pool. And it'll go through their entire relationship. The good, the bad, the good is almost exclusively sex, literally. There are some tender moments, but one of them is him playing guitar for her at an event he's throwing, bearing his soul as it were. But then they have sex in the bedroom while the apartment is loaded with people. But I get it, it's about the passion. So basically every time he does something shitty in one of these flashbacks, you're like, ah, okay, this is what happened. This is why they broke up. That's unfortunate. But no, that wasn't the real breakup. That was just the first time his inability to process emotions caused him to be a dumb fuck. Like he takes her to meet his mom and then the stepdad shows up and immediately starts laying into his character implying that he's just gonna leave Billy once he's bored. A oh, hump him and dump him, isn't that right, son? So Brad of course proves him wrong by calling Billy worthless the second they get outside. Maybe if daddy gave you a little more attention, you wouldn't f the stranger on the first night you met him. But he apologizes, says he pushes people away because his dad left when he was a kid and they're good to go. Until she gets pregnant and he's a dick and basically implies, oh, what are you going to do about it? Tries to tell her that she doesn't want a kid because he has no idea how to be a dad. But again, he comes around, sends a list of baby names and a little adorable leather jacket. So cute, the sensitive badass. But then she tragically miscarries and you think, okay, something's gonna happen here and that's gonna cause it all to fall apart. But no, they pull it back around almost immediately after after they go to a wedding in Billy's family where he cheats on her. I don't want to lose you, B. Are you kidding me? What is wrong with you? Walk away, girl. If the daddy issues make him cheat, it is not worth it. But still, she forgives him and says, okay, figure your shit out. Go talk to your dad and resolve these issues. Then we can make this work. But of course this doesn't happen. He comes back after not seeing his dad, apparently having spent the weekend sleeping with other girls and kicks her out of the apartment. Weeks at most after the miscarriage. You pushed me too far, Billy. By asking you not to be a shithead? So this is the real breakup. She meets Cooper a month later. A whirlwind nightmare of a relationship. And now he has the audacity to be trying to get her back when she's married with two kids. So with all that framing in mind, let's get to the present. When he sees her in Sasha's apartment, he instantly wants her back. I've been trying not to think of you for eight years. Wow, I can tell you were trying real hard by constantly shacking up with her best friend. But it certainly complicates things beyond just fantasizing about your past. So it turns into a situation where she can't abandon these feelings she's having that are multi-layered of missing her wild paths, not feeling satisfied by the safety and stability Cooper provides, and just where she is in life in general while interacting with the other moms from the preschool. Like she's trying to process all these emotions, but they're inviting her out to mommy days. And the preschool teacher needs her to stick around a bunch because Hudson's having attachment issues. I'm mainly just mentioning that so I can point out that the teacher is Lauren Collins of Degrassi? That is Paige Michaelchuk. I've slowly been working on a massive Degrassi video for a while now, and I really hope I can just like buckle down and finish it by the end of the year. I love it. And if you think dumping all these emotions in her journal into her best friend would be good enough, you'd be wrong. She has a breakdown when she realizes that the tattoo shop she used to go to in New York is now a cupcake cake shop and starts spilling to the mommy group. Doesn't seem smart, especially when this woman's husband is your husband's best friend. Ah, it's just a mess of bad decisions because the way she's wording things makes it sound like she might have already done something with Brad. And Cooper is just becoming so obsessed with her past and trying to recreate and one up it and seems to progressively become a shittier and shittier person as a result of his insecurities. But I get it because she's not particularly giving him a reason to feel secure. And Brad is just being a shit, honestly. So Cooper starts looking up Brad 
Brad to see what he's competing with and it doesn't go well. Keep in mind at this point, he doesn't know that Billy saw Brad at Sasha's place. So he has no reason to believe that this isn't anything more than her fantasizing in a journal. And the most contact they've actually had was like a 20 second phone conversation. Not okay that she hasn't mentioned it to him, but like nothing's happened. But he's obsessed, sees that he was on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine, has a picture of Jay-Z. Later on, he literally stalks him to a gym and then pays $600 to potentially like confront him, but doesn't and just gets the full frontal of his massive dong. Like this poor man's ego is just getting rocked from every angle. Like at least his boss is giving him some good positive reinforcement. So I'm sure that's gonna become a problem. I've already watched the show. It becomes a problem. But he finally musters up the gumption to approach Brad, who already knows who he is. It's nice to see you with your clothes on, mate. And actually has the audacity to tell Cooper to relax. It was just a text. So now Cooper knows about the text and just assumes that they're talking more than they actually are. Like, I really don't know why he tracked him down based on the journal entries alone. Like, imagine how weird it would have been had they not bumped into each other at Sasha's apartment. And your ex's husband tracks you down eight years after the breakdown to harass you about sexy journal entries. All this accomplished was making Brad feel super confident in his mission to get Billy back. But his methods of doing this, super fucked up. He FaceTimes her his wang, goes to Sasha's place and uses her phone to FaceTime Billy so she'll actually pick up, convinces Sasha to have sex with him after she already said no, then leaves the phone pointed at them having sex without her knowledge while Billy is watching. Who then touches herself to her ex illegally recording himself have sex with her best friend. But Cooper's best friend's solution to Billy reliving her glory days via journal entries is to try to get Cooper to relive his by calling his divorce to ex-girlfriend to make it seem like Cooper was interested in her, then telling Cooper to just make a move on their boss instead. Who seems into it? You people work together, what is going on? See what I mean? It's just never ending bad decisions and people being unnecessarily cruel. This girl didn't deserve that, she looks lovely. So Coop brings up with Billy that it feels like more than fantasies because her journal entries question so many aspects of their lives together and she's obsessed with her past and Brad. And her genius idea to try to convince Cooper that she's not still in love with with Brad because now he knows that she lied about seeing him and getting texted by him so he thinks that she's just lying about more is to lie and say that Sasha and Brad are dating and suggest that the four of them should go out to dinner together because Brad's obviously going to play into a dinner scenario with your husband to prove that he's not into you and it is an absolute disaster she can't look at him for two seconds about thinking of some of the sex they've had well, you know your wife when she wants something, she can be very persuasive. It's so painfully awkward. But once Brad realizes that she stopped her PhD program to be a stay-at-home mom, he genuinely gets concerned because he knew how much she loved her work. It's hard not to like this douchebag when he seems to actually care about her feelings. Because the second he says, hey, as long as you're happy, that's all I ever wanted, he starts going through all their wild times together and instead of just telling him to shut up, she just gets visibly worked up. So Cooper gets pissed and heads off to talk big with the boss and partners about business and definitely tries to kiss his boss and then stays at her house overnight. Nothing happens, but he was definitely gonna go for it if she hadn't pulled away. Meaning he would have cheated first. Like that dinner was the most that Brad and Billy had spoken in years and you were gonna make a move on a woman that you see every day? This is not good person behavior. I get that you're hurt and you feel betrayed and you feel like your wife is deceiving you, but like, come on, dude. And one of the best things you're gonna find out in this show is what Billy got published for was a psychological paper on the power of monogamy. But after Cooper doesn't come home, she heads in to the city the next morning and notices the obvious tension with him and Francesca. So now she's seeing how quickly things can flip the other way. So she goes to talk to her old professor that doesn't believe in monogamy, which basically makes it seem like she's looking for permission to do something. And he points out that Brad represents the desire and sex excitement that she doesn't feel she gets from the 85% perfect that is Cooper. And she decides that she can just deal without that 15%. Unless you think there's a world in which Brad could somehow give you both. Stop this madness, either go to therapy with Cooper or cut him loose. Cause he'd manage, he's about to be made partner. His ex would take him back in a second. His boss is preying on him, literally waiting for the divorce so she can beat everyone to the top of the rebound list. Ma'am, you are a badass businesswoman. Have some self-respect. And then when it seems like Billy's actually gonna do something with Brad after she met up with him to hear about how it went meeting his dad, she maintains that she loves Cooper only after she starts getting all of his text messages. Could you consider for one moment that maybe you married the wrong guy? Cooper has never hurt me. 
So this kind of clues her into how much she's really messing things up with Cooper. But because she's late getting home and Cooper was gonna bring home supper to celebrate getting partner and try to do things right, he obviously assumes the worst and reads her journal again. Ma'am, just put a password on your laptop or text files, I beg of you! Like not encouraging you to hide things from your husband, but instead of slamming your laptop when you get pissed off, just like lock the damn thing. Or better yet, just stop writing it. Just speak to your husband. That last 15% can cost you everything. And her way to try to make him feel desired is to say that he's worth more than the rush. I'd rather have you than the rush. And I would rather have it all. Well, I can really feel the romance dripping here. Oh yeah, no, like you don't give me that like rush and exciting feeling of love, but like the stability I love. Then she has the audacity to be upset when he says he gets positive feelings from Francesca so he understands where she's coming from. Ma'am, you reap what you sow. So Trina and Devin come over and their way to try to help them work through their marital issues is to invite them to a swingers orgy. <sighs> And it's kind of going okay until Cooper tries to have sex with her in the middle of a group of people all watching and she is not into it, which upsets him. Well, you never would have said no if it was with him. Have some confidence, dude, get it together. But then it gets worse. Trina comes over and starts giving Cooper a blowy, which he agrees to mainly because he can tell it would upset Billy. Again, keep in mind that Billy has not physically cheated. Yes, she got close. She's absolutely emotionally cheating. I'm not saying that she isn't desperately wishing to be rammed by her ex and that she's not messing with Cooper's head but she still hasn't acted on anything. And a blowy is a lot more than the kiss she almost had. And then you gotta remember that Cooper also almost kissed his boss. What is this show? Like, I feel like they're purposely making Cooper seem shittier than he actually is because you need to sympathize more with Billy as the main character. But hey, there's another comparison to 365 using a blowy to instill jealousy. <sighs> and then Devin makes a move on her. This is a nightmare. I know I can give you what you want. Sorry, dude, you're not a leather jacket wearing Australian and you're kind of a sleaze. So Cooper beats the shit out of him. Keep in mind that they work together and Cooper just got made partner, so that's gonna go well. And this doesn't even lead to them finally sitting down and talking. Cooper is just pissed and then Brad pops out to propose to her. Only eight years late there, Dippy. Do you realize that if she agrees, you get to play stepdaddy? But she's clear that Cooper is the future she wants. Oh, yo, my one. Billy man. Shit sucks, bro, you screwed it up. So Cooper obviously watches all this go down, doesn't say anything, only says that he hates her for who he's become. But you know what? I think you were already primed to be shitty, or at least the writers primed you to be shitty. So she finally decides to fix things through writing. And I'm thinking, awesome, we're gonna focus this final episode on getting things a little bit more sorted and back on track, but no. This is where we start hitting my annoyance threshold when situations get so annoying that it makes me wanna commit violence. So Trina, instead of just never mentioning anything, tells all the other preschool moms that Billy was the one that brought them to a sex party and really amps up the fact that Billy cheated on Cooper, which I really get why they believed she really made it seem like she was questioning her marriage. But the moms are cruel. Like Caroline won't let her kid talk to Hudson as if kids can catch adultery. It's always a super reasonable response to take out your misguided judgment of a parent on the child. Good job, Caroline. And now Devin is trying to bribe Cooper to back his bad ideas at work. Otherwise he'll go to HR about Cooper smashing him around. The show just can't let things resolve. It has to dump all this new bullshit in the last 30 minutes. But Cooper won't let that loom over his head and tells Francesca what happened. So she obviously says she has to go to HR, but then also gives him a key to her apartment so that he never has to go back to Billy and it'll be easier to get divorced. Who needs to go to HR now? So I thought that's where he was headed after work, but he was actually going to talk to Brad, which is when he says some stuff that makes me paint him as a huge douche in my mind. Okay, if I walk away, will you take care of her? So first you're like, okay, he cares. He just wants to make sure that Billy will be taken care of if he decides to end the marriage. But then he says something that makes it sound like he was walking away from the kids too. It's not just her, okay? It's my kids too. And I will not walk away unless I know that they're all gonna be okay. Like, I hope he just means the times when he's not around and when they're sharing custody, but it is not worded that way. But Brad's like, I would, but she won't have me. She turned me down. I had fat rock and everything. At the end of the day, Billy really wanted me to be you. So I guess that makes him want to try one more time. So he heads to the school where Billy is finally hitting back against the trash moms. What do you think would have happened if your old boyfriend hadn't turned out to be bald, fat, and in the concrete business? Saying that they're only upset at her because she's making them question things in their own life that they'd rather ignore. Like, 
Maybe, but I think you all just have like way too much time on your hands. So Cooper steps into Defender, but it all kind of falls flat emotionally to me considering he was just ready to pawn her off on Brad. Though I'd like to point out that they're having a very loud fight about sex parties in the middle of a preschool event. Why don't you spare us the lecture and just admit that you're dying to go back to spreading your legs on the Lower East Side? But somehow things work out. Devin decides to tell HR that the whole thing was just a misunderstanding. Billy restarts her PhD program. Caroline stops being a bitch. And everything seems like it's gonna be okay until Sasha gives a talk about her new book dealing with women repressing their true selves. And suddenly the happy, stable marriage where they have more open communication about sex and intimacy isn't enough. So she's running through the streets of New York to Brad's place while Cooper tracks her phone so he calls Francesca once he realizes where she's going. Oh, oh my god. Hello show writers, if you were gonna have this happen, why wouldn't you have just done it when Cooper was gonna bail or when Brad proposed? This is sociopathic. I'm not leaving my husband. This changes nothing. Now f me. Maybe he'll leave you, you absolute psycho. Okay, gather around, friends. Gather around. <clears throat> it's okay if you want to be in a polyamorous relationship. You just can't unilaterally decide on it, you horrible person. And based on her reaction to him liking Francesca's attention, I feel like it wouldn't be like a two-way street type of thing. So we know we're getting a season two to deal with all this insanity while they dance around this toxic relationship with kids in the middle. You can't have your cake and eat it too, Billy. Like it's trying to paint it as if she's trying to find her one true self. But your one true self doesn't have to cheat on your husband. Just like leave him unless your one true self is a cheater. It's so weird because the base concepts I get like don't lose your identity in a relationship. Don't make yourself smaller and sacrifice the things you're passionate about. Don't lose your spark. I also think it's normal to reminisce about the past, especially when you're feeling a little bit isolated as a stay at home mom with two kids. It's just that it takes those concepts and then applies them to genuinely horrible behavior. So it makes it seem like it's never okay to have these feelings. Otherwise you are a horrible person. It's a juggling act of insanity that's wild enough to keep you wondering what stupid thing someone's gonna do next. So you've watched this and decided that you need a different type of comedy featuring a mom looking for some thrills. Something like a simple favor, for example, but oh no, it's not available where you live. Well, today's sponsor, ExpressVPN, has you covered. By connecting to their fast and secure server locations, ExpressVPN makes your internet think you're in a different location so you can take full advantage of region lock content. To find out exactly which server to use, head on over to unogs.com, look up any movie or show you're hoping to watch and it'll tell you exactly what countries it's available in. So for a simple favor, all you have to do is connect to a Canadian server location and that's where Netflix will think you are. And it's not just for Netflix, I use it all the time for streaming services that aren't available where I live, including BBC iPlayer where I've been watching What We Do in the Shadows. ExpressVPN has been one of the most useful tools for this channel and I'm constantly using it for film festivals and to watch the different types of movies I need to make content for you guys. It's super fast, I never run into buffer issues when streaming and I use it across multiple devices seamlessly. So if you want to try out ExpressVPN for yourself and find out how you can get three months free, head on over to expressvpn.com slash Jedi or click the link in the description below. In conclusion, this show is less abusive than 365 because it does not involve literally kidnapping someone, but it is a toxic dumpster fire of emotional manipulation from multiple characters that are all so disgustingly selfish that you don't feel sorry for any of them by the end. So I really just kind of hate everyone, except Sasha, an honest queen. And I guess Brad's being honest too. He just does some really horrible, terrible things. But that's gonna do it for today's video on sex life. Let me know if you watched it and what you thought. Uh, this was a really fun one to film because I get to get all animated and stuff. So I hope you enjoyed. Thank you all so much for watching. Thanks as always to my Patreon supporters. Subscribe to the channel if you're new. Leave a like on the video if you're into that kind of thing. I hope you're all having a fantastic day. I'm mostly okay and we'll catch you all later.